What's up, family? Welcome to another episode of Rappers in My Backyard, the podcast that stays lit. We rap about relationships, music, and entertainment. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We're going to hit the road running. And today we're going to talk about true game with our special guests. And on the grill, we will be throwing on the Shaw, Crenshaw Boulevard, and its significance to our culture and hip hop in general. And like every show, I love to set it up with a quote that lays the groundwork for a provocative and interesting conversation. So here's the quote. A people without the knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And that comes from Marcus Garvey. And I believe that that sets us up nicely to talk, express, relate, connect with our special guest today, C.J. Mack. (laughs) I love that setup. Thank you. I love that setup. Thank you, Lisa. Hey, man. Thank you. We're going to talk about some true game today, man. And just letting these folks know this great history and legacy that you have. And uh, I know you, CJ Mack, and I know the great music that you've done and the different clicks that you have manifest from. But our audience, unfortunately, does not know that information. So let's kick it off by you telling us some of the work that you put down in this game and how you started out in general with it. Well, I was, uh, I was really just a street hustler, you know, that enjoy rap. I've been writing raps on paper bags and everything else since I was 14 years old. Right. So I got to the point of, uh, you know, I was a kid in a single family home that wanted money. So I kind of went off on the a tangent of making sure that I had some Uh (laughs) by any means necessary. So I was a street dude, you know, and then I was watching my friend, I had a love for rap music, but then I was watching a lot of the artists in LA, they was kind of like rapping the lifestyle that I was living. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I started more and more and more, I started wanting to get into it and I couldn't just, I couldn't figure out why well, I'm, I'm going to get in there. You know, it's, it's a funny story. There's an album cover with NWA mm-hmm. where they're sitting down getting their shoes shined by a guy. And they did that picture downtown Los Angeles in the parking garage that was right next door to the Western Union. Mm-hmm. So back then, you know, you can go get a bunch of money out the Western Union. You know, you know, you can go get your nine, ten bands. Out there, you know, so I got like three girls with me. I'm going to pick up thirty, forty thousand dollars. And I look at them, and they sitting here doing this thing right here, this rap group, right. And at first, I was kind of like, yeah, okay, <laughs> you know, what I mean? <laughs> like, you know. But then I start saying, well, look, you know what? They're rapping about how I'm living, and I know this. I know what I'm talking about is the truth, so I want to do this. So then mm-hmm. I started surrounding myself around people that were in the game. Mixed Master Spade put me on. Okay. So he, yeah, he introduced me to King T, King T and DJ Pooh, and you know, I watched King T get $150,000 for a deal. I was like, whoa, $150,000? Oh, I got to learn this, you know? I didn't even know what a bar was. I went and rap with DJ Pooh, and I was just rapping, you know what I mean? He was like, right. does it have a hook? I was like, what's the hook? <laughs> he said, how many bars is that first? I was like, what's a bar? Right. <laughs> you know? So I just started surrounding myself around what I wanted to be. And eventually, you know, with a lot of hard work and effort, it happened. Right. So that right. was the start. Then I, I ended up going to, go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask you because you already had money to get in this game. So you had started out independently right before yeah. you got signed to rap a lot yeah i was putting out independent projects because i didn't you know i didn't have any you know those guys are kind of doing what they were doing you know mm-hmm. what i mean so i was helping out you know and some cats i was keeping the lights on you know what I mean? right <laughs> <laughs> but they were busy doing what they were doing and, and they i don't think anybody was really taking me seriously in the beginning and mm-hmm. i had a lot of learning to do so i just started doing it on my own so at first i wanted to be like you know, like LL Cool J and uh, 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 Big Daddy Kane and them. You know? <laughs> right. 
<laughs> so my first project I put out was kind of like that. I even okay. moved to Atlanta because the Atlanta scene was getting on so that I could learn more mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, learn the game and stuff like that. So, yeah, my first stuff was independent. Okay. And then, uh, and then I just came back and I did, I did two independent projects, actually. And the second one, mm-hmm. you know, um, I just kind of started letting it go and started rapping about how I was living. Okay. And, you know, doing it, how we was doing it on this side, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then that started getting a little bit of notice and eventually I ended up on Rap A Lot Records. What I was saying is that a lot of up and coming artists wish that they can be independent. And by you coming to this game already independent, right? And being able to pay for your own project, what type of things did you encounter once you got with a label and seeing well, that there was a lot of differences? Well, uh, first of all, when I, I, well, first of all, I like to say that it takes a lot more than just having money uh, okay. to be able to do the project. It's so much more that you need to know. You got to have so much more information. You got to know how to circulate the record. You got to know about distribution. You got to know about, back then, you got to know about pricing and positioning, you know, mm-hmm. knowing where your record would be in a record store when there's, you know, 100,000 records in here. What's going to make a person go to yours? And back right. then, the whole system was different. We had to make a person actually, you know, I had to let you see me on a, bu- a bus stop bench, see me on a billboard, see the music video, hear me on the radio. It took a lot of things to drive a person to actually drop, to m- cause them to drive by McDonald's, you know, and into the record store and spend that money that you could have ate with to buy your CD. Mm-hmm. Now it's kind of like just push a button, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and they yeah. can get the record. You don't have to do as much ever. You don't have to work so hard to get a person to, to check your music out. Mm-hmm. So when I got to, but to answer your question, when I got to the label, it was, it was, it was more complicated because they were spending a whole lot more money and they had a lot more people to deal with than just myself. Mm-hmm. So then the politics were around what artists were selling the most for them already. You know, sometimes labels are just put enough money out there to throw something against the wall and see if it sticks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I love rap a lot records. I love uh, Jay Prince for giving me an opportunity and I love being a part of that label because it helped me establish my brand and who I am today. Mm-hmm. But that was a that was a machine over there. Scarface, the Ghetto Boys, that was automatic. They knew what they were going to do, how much money they were going to spend. Mm-hmm. Everybody else, they kind of just threw a bunch of projects at one time up against the wall to see what stick. So you wasn't going to get like a whole lot of extra effort. Right. So if I was spending the money myself, Obviously, I would have done another video and another video and another video. Well, mm-hmm. it didn't work that way, dealing with labels. Right. And a lot of uh, artists, I think, Mac, don't understand in this game that you're really just getting fronted the money by the label. They get their money back. This ain't no freebie. Th- they're going to get the money back, and they're also going to be spending money on other people. And, you know, and you're going to be paying for that, too. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Somebody might be going out to dinner and, and on a promotional tour on your budget, and you yeah. have no control of that. But guess what? When that bill comes, it's coming out of your, it's coming out of your paycheck, right? Yeah. It's coming out of your royalty. So yeah, so many different twists and turns when it when it comes to dealing with with uh with labels. That today, I would definitely prefer being an independent artist versus being on a label. Yeah. Yeah, it makes more sense, especially because you have so many avenues in which to get your music out there. You don't really need to rely on a label in the same way. However, there are elements that I do believe that our hip hop today is suffering from that the label did provide for them, which is artist development. These artists are just getting out here now. And unfortunately, you know, learning by making mistakes, you know, before even being genuinely prepared. So what's your thought about the need of artist development back in this mix? Well, I think, that that could definitely be useful. I Mm -hmm. think that, you know, anyone can just get up and download anything they want. No one has to really look at it. You know, no one, no one's approving it. No one's checking it, you know, for quality at all. So we're suffering in the quality department right now because no one's standing there to check you. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. even amongst other artists, like some of the stuff, you know, I I can't even believe like they homeboys don't even tell them like, Hey bro, that's, you know, (laughs) <laughs> we were hard on each other. Like we were tough on each other when you came to the studio. If your if your stuff was whack, 
you know, it probably get the freeway test. You know, you know the freeway test. <laughs> Let them know <laughs> the freeway test. test. And if it ain't cool, toss it out the window on the freeway. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, I think yeah, I think the game is suffering a little bit from that. You yeah. know, but, but but for the most part, these you know these kids, they're creative in a different way. Yeah. So I'm not one of the old cats that knocked the new guys because when I first came out, I was doing a whole lot of cussing and I wasn't mm-hmm. saying raw at the end of every verse, right? And there's sort of rappers before me, that's how they got down. You know? Right. And so they probably was looking at my stuff like, man, these dudes whack, they cussing, they doing this, they doing that. So it's kind of like when you can't get with what's going on now and adjust it to what you're doing, then you got the game, hang up your shoes. You know what I mean? You got to do something else. Right, right. And and just like I was talking about it, especially for the, the female rappers, you know what I mean? Because we never seem to get the just due that we deserve. You know, and a lot of people's talking smack now about the sexual popularity on a lot of the female MC records. And me and a couple of friends of mine, we were just being real and just talking and saying that, hey, this is where their mindset is now. It's all about sexuality. It's all about women saying, hey, y'all didn't beat us down with the third leg. Now we beating y'all down with this walk, you know? (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, we got to be open-minded for that. Like you saying, Mac, we got to be able to understand the progression of our art form, whether or not we believe with, you know, that we're in tune with the subject matter. That that's that that's my my feelings uh one hundred percent. Um mm-hmm. it's stuff that I that I can't get with and I don't understand. I just accept that I can't understand it or that that I don't like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and just and rap rap music and any genre of music has always been a choice. You know, you can always like flip look listen to something else if you don't like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So so it's the same choice with what's happening with the, the music that a lot of the ladies are doing right now. I mean, some of it is me being older now, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when I was younger, maybe I wouldn't have tripped off some of that stuff. But some of this stuff, you know, when you got like I got a I got a six, seven year old granddaughter, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't want her repeating probably some of the some of the lyrics like on some of those songs, right? But guess what? It was some guys that had a seven year old grandson that didn't want to repeat what I was saying. Yeah. So I can't be a hypocrite now and knock someone for their, their choice of expressing themselves. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not I'm not of the population that does that. I don't, I don't really do that. I don't hate on the, the young people or the women. Or, I, I just, I just kind of don't do it because, believe me, I was saying some things that when I listen to some of my music come back, then I'm like, damn, my mindset was totally different. Yeah. Yeah. And there should be progression in that. And 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 me and you are in agreement with that too. I, I do everything that I can to try to plug in and understand what's happening now and what they're saying now. You know, right. just another point, like there was a lot of, of course there's a lot of drugs in hip hop, you know, weed and stuff like that. It seemed to be more towards early hip hop and like now, you know, more of the cats are getting into lean and pills and Xanax and all of this stuff. So we got to understand that what they're doing is regurgitating or sharing with us their experience on those particular narcotics. You're right. You know, you're absolutely absolutely right. And so, I mean, although, I'm looking and wanting more. I've had to look at it from the standpoint of this is what they're doing now. And this is the process that they're going through. And this is the things that's coming through their head as they're being digested. So that's a whole nother way of how we need to look at it. Would you agree or or disagree with that? I agree with that 100%. I think that you're absolutely right. You know, they're they're rapping about their experiences and the things they're going through. They can't say the things like a lot of times um, older, older artists will say, well, you know, they can't they're not saying the stuff we said. Well, they didn't live the same life. Like you said, they're expressing yeah. themselves from the perspective that they are looking at every day when they walk outside their homes right now. Mm-hmm. This is what they, this is what they're doing with their friends. And it just is what it is. You know, yeah. I, I'm not 
friends sit up and drink and lean and all that. You know, I'm not gonna do all that. You know what I mean? So, yeah. but that doesn't mean that that's not what they're looking at every single day. Are they homeboys pulling up? And you know, I might have hit the joint back in the days because my homeboy pulled up and hit the joint. I might have started smoking weed like that. So they going yeah. through the same thing. It's just a different type of lifestyle, different type of drug. And so they rapping about what they're going through. Unfortunately, some of these kids dying, yeah, overdosing, and you know all that kind of shit. You know, living that lifestyle. But I mean, you know, people was dying from gang, gang banging, and everything else like they've been doing back in my day. So, you know, you can't really just you have to listen, try and understand, and help you who you can help. You know, and insert yourself and be in a position to help who you can help and try and spread your message. But I don't, you, you're not gonna do it by knocking people. Yeah, that's that's for sure, because we got to be able to leave space to have a conversation and having people like you on this podcast, being able to lay down and share with them what the true game is based out of your experience, you know, is in my hope is building a gap of communication. I mean, a bridge of communication between our OGs such as yourself with the new crop of hip hop artists we have that is necessary man for our culture like it, it's just not it's going to die if we don't do that if somebody doesn't take that responsibility and i do it i, I get in the studio with a lot of uh my younger homies and stuff like that and they getting down they'll ask me stuff and i give them my opinion and i'll tell them well you know you know this is the reason and, and i'll tell them like some of the reasons uh the west coast Sometimes we don't have the same uh, uh, type of songs or hits or whatever because for one, at one point we were stuck. At one, like I like what they're kind of doing now, like the Roddy Ridges and this and that and this and that. Mm-hmm. Because we were stuck at one point. Like we only made mad music. We were angry, yeah. and it's just like I'm gonna kill you. And every fucking lyric is like, <laughs> even in New York news, they knew how to say I'm gonna kill you, and they said it's smoother than us. You know, right. when we said it's like somebody called the police because they serious to come to guns. You know. They they talk about killing you in the 50 Cent used to make songs talking about I'm gonna kill you and the shit sound like it was methodic. It's like you just rocking with that shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So so we got stuck on being NWA. NWA was such a powerful force when it came to the type of music that they put out. I, I did an interview the other day and I was saying that the whole image of Los Angeles hip hop scene. Is based on gangs and gang banging and the low rider and, 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 and crip walk to the refrigerator, grab a 40 gallons, go shoot two, three people, get your hair braided, go to sleep, right? That is, that's not the era that I saw. You know, yeah. my, my era was more like Peyton Ford when it was slanting those Porsches, businesses with the curtains in the back, Rolls Royces, Ferraris. That's what was going up and down Crenshaw. Right. That's what was going up. What NWA did was only one part of the city or one, one section that was probably going on more so in their area. My area was fly as hell. Yeah. And didn't so get that, that same story attention. never really been told. Yeah. Yep. You're absolutely right because they have basically put the West Coast down to, to, to one artist that established us. So when we do come out with something that's not necessarily gang oriented they're kind of confused you know like it took him a while to get nipsey hustled in me like he was dope from the gate but it took people a while to understand why he wasn't banging from the same frame of mind he was still banging you know what i mean but he was given another perspective of the gang bang yeah he's closest to 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 what we used to do, where he's actually, first of all, a motivator. He's he's a he's a straight motivator. He's a motivational speaker through hip hop. Yeah, he is. And you know, he was talking about the streets in the same environment, the same thing he lived in. But what he chose to talk about was success, motivation, and moving people forward and making yeah. them understand. He's from where he's from. That's my little boy. From the, we from the same neighborhood, so we had conversations and different things at, at different times. You know, mm. and. I respect his, his his mindset and the message that he wanted to put out was stronger than oh you smoke on the lean and da, 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 whatever that yeah. wasn't really his thing. His thing was I want to help motivate and push people forward in my community and other communities and people that's going through the same thing I'm going through it and have witnessed the same things that I've witnessed. I want to try and tell you, man, this is how you get out of that. This is how you yeah. hustle to motivate. So that's what was different in him. 
And that's why he stood out. Yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't get to, you know, to, to enjoy much of his music, mm -hmm. you know, because he had so much more to say. And so he was going, he was on his way oh. and going far. So unfortunately, you know, that got cut short. But um, yeah, he was totally different. And that, that was the message that he wanted to push. Yeah. Yeah. And he was showing us, you know, how to become owners of the things that we spend a lot of money on. You know, from yeah. fashion to living in the flyest places and being the baddest on the block. You know, so rest in peace, Nipsey. Hustle. Yes. You know, because yes, he, he, he really did contribute a lot. And we do have his legacy to look at to move forward and start owning some stuff, you know? Right. And he talked that to the young and old. Yes, indeed. And yeah. I got to ask you, what is your definition of true game? Mac, because you've been in this thing a long time and you've been able to navigate between being with a Roofless Records, a rap a lot, a death row. I mean, you've been able to go in lanes that many of us can't switch to. How was you able to switch lanes without wrecking a car? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I like that. Well, I think, I think all in all, is just what it says, true game by, 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 first of all, with that record, I decided to do me. This mm -hmm. is the true me. This ain't no gimmicks. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what it is. This is how I'm feeling. I was losing a whole bunch of homeboys. I had songs like Let My Niggas Out The Pen. I had a whole lot of homeboys going to penitentiary, you know, that now they just getting out from doing 22, 23 years. And all yeah. I was losing, some of my best friends was going under, you know, and God blessed me to where I was the one who was still out here. So mm -hmm. a lot of that was my true feelings. And this was right. my game. Like, this was my truth in the game that I was living in. Mm -hmm. So I was able to put that out there. So that's what the true game was. And other than that, just being upstanding and not having no smut on my name, not doing no bull crap, you know what I mean? And just trying to be a man of my word and things like that and, 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 and stand down when I had to stay down, you know, like. You know, I, I didn't resonate letting nobody really push through to no lines on me and all that, but I wasn't no bully. You know what I mean? I, I wasn't right. running trying to be no bully, but I'm gonna stay down and I'm gonna do that in any circumstance, whether it's you know, me and Suge having a conversation or me and this person, that person, it don't it don't matter to me. Mm -hmm. I believe in men first. Right. So Los Angeles, we're, we're we're so divided in like when it comes to the gang culture. Every 10 blocks, you know, it's a different gang in Los yeah. Angeles. So I was a kid, first of all that my mother was poor, so we lived all over the place. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn how to navigate. Maybe that's where it started, as a matter of fact. <laughs> you know, I had to start driving that car early. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm going to school now, and I'm my mom's, you know, she she wasn't going for none of that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you know, moving where she had to move. So I'm like, hey, that ain't gonna work for me. She's like, well, then you shouldn't be running around doing this bullshit. You know, that's how my mother was, right? Mm -hmm. So now I got to learn how to you know, coexist with these guys from this certain neighborhood now because I can't do nothing about it. This is where I live. Yeah. You know, so I learned how to make sure I measure men by being men first. Right. So in each one of those situations that I was in, it was um, it was man to man conversations. I, I had to go see Suge four times when he was in penitentiary because he's trying to get me to sign a death row. And I ah. told him, and I told him, I don't think that that's going to work mm -hmm. with me. Right. Because it was too different. <laughs> <laughs> Very different. <laughs> right? So it was yeah. like, you know, it, that probably won't work. But we had major respect for each other and mm -hmm. love for each other. You know what I'm saying? Like, I had this song one time. I saw I got love for Suge and Snoop. You know what I mean? Right. Because, like... I dealt with the man on a totally different basis than someone else may have had dealt with him. So I ain't, I ain't a shield hater. You know what I mean? Right. He looked out for me on some things and then he was shocked. One time she gave me some money for a project, right? And then okay. we didn't end up with the project. So you know what I did? I took the cashier's check for all the money that she gave me and gave it back to him. Mm -hmm. He was in the pandemic. They called and they said, man, CJ Mack is up here with a check for you. Okay. And he was like, Put him on the phone. He's like, what you, what, what's that for? I said, man, remember the money you gave me, blah, blah, blah. We didn't do the thing. He said, hey, man, ain't nobody in the history of me doing music gave me my money back. Yeah. He said, man, 
you know what? You keep that music, man. Damn that project, man. You keep you keep that money, bro. And me and him been a whole nother level ever since. She like, man, nobody never gave me no money back, man. Wow. Wow. So that's those type of things is how I'm able to navigate and move around because I'm just gonna be as solid as I can possibly be in every situation. Right. So basically, true game means truth. Being truthful about what it is that you can contribute to and being truthful to the things that you're not going to do regardless. And so that got to do with boundaries, man. We can't just be so thirsty for that that coin that we forget who we are in the scheme of things. That's true exactly. game. Exactly. That's true game. In a nutshell, that's a true game. And, you know, and like I said, a, and a lot of it was just the things I was going through when I was expressing myself and letting people know how I felt. When I listen back to that album sometimes, I'm like, wow, you know, because you don't grow. If you still acting the same way or thinking the same way you were when you were 25 years old and you need something wrong with you anyway, right? Yeah. So when I listen back to some of the things that I was saying on that record, man, and some of the pain, there's a yeah. lot of pain on that record. Yeah. And, and it was like, and it was like, when, when I listen to it, I'm like, damn, like it trips me out. Like I, I may listen to that record like once every like three or four years, you know, I might get on the freeway or something and pop it in, you know? And uh, and it, it really trips me out, like my mindset at that age. And it was yeah. the truth, it was exactly how I was feeling. Yeah, yeah, you was on fire in true game. And you know what, Mac? That sets us up nice to go to the grill. Because we talking about the Shaw, Crenshaw. It you know is. what I mean? Crenshaw was everything to us on the West Coast and to the hip hop, you know, culture. And I just want to lay some facts out for our audience first about what Crenshaw was about before we came and exploited it. But right. um, so some of the facts are is that it is the main street for black Los Angeles, that's first. And then secondly, in the 1920s, it was a diverse neighborhood that included Jews and Eastern Europeans. Right. But we rolled up in there in the 1970s <laughs> and we got with Lamar Park and we formed a neighborhood that would reek of African American culture. Love it, love it, love it. So, yes, indeed. You know, since the 70s, that area has somewhat been in our control. And I wanted to get with you, Matt, because you authentic Crenshaw and you know the history as it refers to what it was used for for hip hop. So let's get down on it. Let's get it. Let's get it. All right. So first I want to ask you, man, a lot of videos was shot on Crenshaw, like Cube got down on Crenshaw. Of course, Tupac laced us, you know, and who else? Who else did their video on Crenshaw? I did my videos over there. Kenny I King. knew. <laughs> Almost every L.A. artist has. Almost yeah. every LA, L.A. artist has used some sort of, uh, some setting on Crenshaw to shoot their video. Right. And I'm telling you, it's like, it's such a nucleus of our culture and upbringing in a sense. I mean, even uh, Tom Petty, he shot Free Falling on the wow. show. Okay. So, you know, it wasn't just us. It was like that area is so powerful in what we have fed into it that everybody wants to be a part of it. You yeah. know? So when you I did... What was important to you about doing your video on Crenshaw Boulevard? You and uh, shout out to my man, Kitty Kingpin, when y'all did uh, cruising. Come down. take a ride. Yeah, come take a ride when y'all was cruising down the Shaw. What made you, you know choose what? Crenshaw? I mean, that's the truth. I mean, that's the street I was going to ride. I've been riding down that street all my life. You know, I've lived, put it this way, I've never lived on the east side of Western in my entire life. Wow. I've, I've never, I've never, the closest I've, farthest I've ever lived is like maybe off Van Ayers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my entire life, right? So, so uh, I mean, you know, while living in Los Angeles. 
So that's all I know. I know Crenshaw. Like I said, I know a different Crenshaw. I've seen the different phases Crenshaw has gone through, you know? I know right. Crenshaw from being a little kid, nodding and dashing out of the Holiday Bowl with my football pads on, you know, after football practice. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Let me jump in on the Hollywood Bowl because uh, that sucker was cracking. It was just like the center of, like, all of the activity that was going down yeah. there on the show. That was the music scene, right, initially? Well, well, no, no, I mean the, the Holiday Bowl right there on 39th. Oh, like okay. Crenshaw. Remember okay. the bowling alley used to be right there. Okay, that's right, they that's a, right. They had, food, they had a food place right there by the bowling alley. So I know Crenshaw from me being a little kid, eating my food and running up out of there because we didn't have money to pay for it to <laughs> to, to ride down there with low riders and El Caminos and, mm -hmm. and Mercedes Benzes and Porsches. And it's always been a center. Like everybody came out every Sunday and was rolling out Crenshaw, you know what I mean? So right. Crenshaw has always been a part of my life. Mm -hmm. Crenshaw Boulevard has always been a part of my life since I've been a child. So it's very important for me to be able to do a video that I could ride down, cruise down the show and, and let the whole world see what Crenshaw Boulevard was. Right, right. So what what would you say is the best car to, to low ride in? Like I'm hearing Chevys, I'm here in 1968. What was y'all rolling in? Well, 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 I had, a, I had, a, I had a deuce. I had, okay. a, I had, a, I had, a, I had a, with, with 62, 63. Uh -huh. But my right now, I'm still, it ain't over. Right now, I'm looking for a 59. My partner, shout out Chris Mill, got the coldest 59 Chevy. It's called the Mothership. Uh -huh. He got the coldest 59 Chevy in the game with the Batman wings in the back and all that. So I'm looking for one of those. Right now, I think the coldest car on the streets is a 59. 59? Everybody, right. everybody loves a 58 Chevy, but. That 5.9 for me, man, I got to have it. You got to have it, huh? Yeah. That sounds like a plan. And it's just like now I just roll down there and it's like, man, there is no Sunday cruising no more. What's yeah. up with that? What happened? Well, I think it's different. I mean, I think that uh, the car game has, has changed. You know, you had all kind of you know, different car clubs, you know, mm -hmm. you had your Nissan trucks, you had your, even your little Sentras. <laughs> picked up centras or whatever, you know. You had all these different little cars and car clubs back then. So, you know, things change. You know, like right now, the Harley Davidson scene is real big. So you mm -hmm. still might see some cold Harleys coming down Crenshaw. So it's still going on. It's just not the meeting place no more. And then now, I'm, I'm going to say it's probably a little bit more violence than it was back in the days. And the police and everything is controlling Crenshaw more. Yeah. You know, and then they got it all tore up with all this work they've been doing for a thousand years, you know, with the gentrification movement. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's just a kind of like a different scene on Crenshaw right now. A, a lot of those businesses, man, I mean, they have hardships. They got all yeah. this construction going on. For, so it, it's just not what it used to be right now. Yeah, it really isn't. And you know what I've been noticing, just like I told you at the top when we was talking about facts for the Shaw, you know, it's starting to look a lot like the 1920s again. You know, so we, I'm, I'm telling you, we slipping. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if we got caught up in that little fake thing that they did in reference to raising the value of those homes in that area. And everybody went to sell them. And now realizing that we can't really find any other place to be able to set our families up in. Yeah, you got a lot of people walk around now with, uh, Dogs, baby strollers, and dolphin shorts on. You know, yeah, that, and flip flops. That, so I know it. Hey, it, and not and not afraid. No, not <laughs> afraid at all. You know, yeah. so I mean, it's just interesting to see. You know yeah. how things change when we let a let go of what the dream initially is. Well, so what they did was make sure that the housing was cheaper on the outskirts. So go move to Lancaster, go move yeah. to Moreno Valley, go move, you know, to the Inland Empire, because we're tired of taking that long drive downtown where all the business is jumping off. You know, we want to be right here in the Adams District. We want to be, right. you know, right off Crenshaw Boulevard, and you want to have an easy commute. You know, I'm looking at the things that they're building. I used to have a building on Jefferson. Okay. Uh, Jefferson, Buckingham. I ran the entire TV production studio uh record label, everything was run right out of my building right there. Okay. And I did, I did Sea Walk, I did a documentary Sea Walk from there and all that. That property has tripled 
since I sold it. Wow. The rent may have been, you know, fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars around there. Mm. It's up to like four grand right now. Wow. But guess what? Not many of us own that land. That's the thing. All these big apartment buildings and complexes that are going up on Crenshaw Boulevard. I mean, every time we turn around now, there's a new apartment building. But guess what? We're not the owners of those buildings. Right, right. So I am working with a, a, a young man that's tasked with making sure that we are included in some of these deals and different things like that and make sure we get um, a share in some of that business that's going on up and down Crenshaw and Jefferson Boulevard and stuff like that. So there are... Um, people involved in the city politics that are trying to make sure that we can be included in, in some of these deals. Yeah. I mean, because right now, like I said, we looking like we getting ready to roll back to the 1920s and even on another level, it just seems like we are not getting the opportunity to share in the upgrading of the area. So, because I'm hearing from a lot of people that it's hard for them to even get businesses there, like even be in the running to negotiate. We are totally out of the conversation, you know? And so this is just not cool at all. So I'm happy to know that you're getting involved in making sure, you know, because we know if uh, Nipsey Hussle was alive, he would be on every sort of, board to make sure that we get a say in it because he was an owner in that area but now they didn't even i don't know what's going on with his piece of property but i know there was a time that they was trying to move him out of there so i don't know what's going on with that i'm sure they're still tussling a little bit about it but we got to be able to be a part of its growth and transition yeah. I, I don't know much about uh their business or what was going on with nipsey and them and uh but I do know that there are, um, you know, there are some people involved. Uh, I don't want to misspeak, so that's why I'm not saying any names, but right. I could come back another time or give you the information to be able to post. There are groups that are trying to make sure that we are included in businesses that are going to be going up. Mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's talk of funding so that uh, a certain amount of people can be trained to own businesses, whether it may be a, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in Inglewood, new businesses are gonna go, or whether it's a Buffalo Wild Wings or a, mm -hmm. a uh, you know, Subway or whatever, there's gonna be training programs or that are helping people that live in the community to become franchise owners and things of that right. sort so that they can't be a part of it. I mean, it's still gonna be uh, disproportionate. We're not gonna have what we should have mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, it takes a lot of money. There's a lot of big money being spent. So the people in the neighborhood, you know, you know, the median income isn't that of something that can put together a $10 million project. So that's how we really get, that's how we're getting phased out because of the, the almighty dollar, you know, the almighty yeah. money dollars. But there are people that are working hard within our community to make sure that we are, that, that, that the city remains inclusive and mm -hmm. make sure that we can be involved. Right. So, well, thank you know. goodness for that. And you know what, Matt? We're going in the Shaw in Crenshaw Boulevard on that note. We're going to stay hopeful. Yeah. And keep yeah. on rolling. So take it off the grill. Take it away. Take it away. <laughs> Woo. All right. We back at it again. They tried me today. I got my headphones on. Everything is trying to go haywire. You know, but uh, I love this so much, man. I wouldn't care if I came back with a baseball cap, some braces and some glasses. I'm still going to stay lit for y'all. So let's keep this going with CJ Mack. So Mack. Yep. Can you hear me, man? Are we yep, fully I can hear connected? You <laughs> yep, I can hear you. All right, cool. So let's talk about Come and Take a Ride because... That song to me is like the theme song for Crenshaw Boulevard. And uh, how did that come together? How did you and Kenny Kingpin come together to uh, put that nice concept together and basically created the theme song for Crenshaw Boulevard, in my opinion? 
Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We were we were both artists on Rap a Lot Records. Like I said, uh, Jay Prince, he wanted to do a uh, Rap a Lot West. So okay. we were the first artists out of LA that was signed. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we might not, I think Menace Clan, Clan might have been signed before us, I'm not sure, but we were uh, some of the first artists signed over there at Rap a Lot Records. And we just wanted, to, Kenny and I, we had did a whole song of, you know, the streets and shoot them up and, and everything else. So we said, you know what, let's do a let's do a summer song, man, that we could just cruise to and just show Prince Charles Boulevard and, and everything. And then at the time, the third person on the song was an artist by the name of Sexy. Okay. Uh, yeah, Kim 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 Ward. And uh she had really, really soulful. She was a rapper and singer, but she was really soulful. I loved her singing. So I was like, hey, I need you to sing on this chorus right here. And she tore it up. I mean, she got cracking. So we went in there and it was just chemistry. You know, I've been knowing Kenny since he's probably like 13, 14 years old. You know, uh -huh. he had got his first record deal at, uh, I believe, 15 years old or so. So he was always my little homeboy, and I just kind of like mentored him on street stuff and different little things. So we just, we were, ended up on the same label. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, we said, let's, let's make sure we do one hot song on each other's albums. Uh -huh. And so I'm going to take a ride. Just, it, it just took off. We just got in there, and I did a verse, he did a verse, I did a verse, he did a verse. Kim came there, did the hook, and it was bomb. And we had a producer that was actually, with that West Coast sound at the time, mm -hmm. our producer was actually from Richmond, Virginia. Ah, okay. Yeah, this guy was so talented. His name was Matt. So when you saw this Matt, CJ Matt, uh -huh. Matt was actually a whole other person. Oh, okay. And people don't know that. Matt was actually the producer. Uh-huh. And uh, he was out of Virginia. We just put it together, got in there, man. He had those sounds, and his father would do a bunch of licks. His father was like the best bass player in Virginia. Mm -hmm. So he would get in there and do some licks for us, and we'd take those licks and sample them and just come up with dope music. And uh, it's just a song that I I'm amazed. Like, when I look at the Internet sometimes, now people post that song. You know, I'm amazed that today people love it. They're like, well, what is that? Who is that? What is that? You know, and then you have people explaining the history of the song and all that. You know, and I, I really, I appreciate that it was able to stand up so long. Yeah, yeah. It stands up because it has all the elements of what a great song has. You know, it brings us in visually, you know, it keeps us mentally, and it really motivates us emotionally. I think with those three ingredients, man, it just came together really good at, on that record. And then, of course, the energy between you and Kingpin, you know, I mean, Kingpin was on fire around the fountain down there on Crenshaw, <laughs> <laughs> the Merck Park. I mean, he was on fire. And uh, shout out to uh, Kenny Kingpin. We love him dearly. And uh, he's yeah, yeah. rocked with us, too. Yeah, That's he's a real pro. The song could have gone bigger if we would have had cooperation with radio at the time. Uh -huh. I think I was a questionable... Uh, I was a questionable figure at the time. Okay. I think my, my street background um, kind of hurt me, mm -hmm. uh, hurt my career back then because it was like, I wasn't looked at as a rap artist. They're like, oh no, he's different. Mm -hmm. So you had certain authorities going to radio stations and, and blocking events that we would throw and you know causing a little bit of confusion you know, um, opening up van doors on me, CJ, I got my eye on you, because, because of my history before rap music. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, I don't think, I know that I was being monitored. Mm -hmm. um, they were saying things about my area, saying that they were having too many problems because all that money from the 80s was gone, and that I had to be monitored because they were in fear that a, a they would see some of the things, same things that they saw earlier mm -hmm. uh, out of me. Right. And that wasn't necessarily the case. I was, you know, in the process of changing my life and doing what I love doing. But mm -hmm. it was, it was, a, it was definitely a real issue with me and radio and moving forward. Right, right. So what was that change that you decided to make in your life that was the game changer from then and now? Well, all of my life, I, I think not only myself, but I think everybody has an alarm clock in their body that tells you when it's time to change up or it's time to do something different. Right. So the difference is if you ignore that clock or if you're able to uh, pay attention to that clock and move accordingly. You know, I was a high school student. I was a baseball athlete. I was a star baseball player. I got hurt and I turned to the streets. 
Right. And I started, you know, I, I started doing a lot of, I, I mean, I was the type of kid, I was going to school every day because my mother carried a pistol every day. Now, I wasn't playing with Betty Ross. So I went to school. <laughs> but 302, I was trying to get cracking. <laughs> right, right. But you <laughs> so made sure there. you paid homage to your mom. Oh, oh, your mom's is dope, you yeah, know. Yeah. So I ended up, uh, I'm sorry, someone's trying to chime in. So I, uh, I decided that, uh, you know, my life had to be a little bit different. So I, I saw my demise coming really, really soon. Mm -hmm. So I went to the, so I went to the military for a bit, you know what I mean? Oh, and then okay. I stayed in prison. So when I went to the military, my brother went to the penitentiary because he didn't want to go with me. He wanted to stay out here and we he was doing the same things that we both were doing and he went to the penitentiary yeah. well my brother's actually my cousin but we, we were more like brothers mm -hmm. so he went to the penitentiary i saw japan korea australia blah 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 philippines he saw san quentin tracy Folsom. you know what i mean yeah so we got out at the same time and what happens out of the frying pan to the fire yeah. i'm 21 years old my friends show me hundred thousand dollars and tell me I can get that $25 at a time with this little stuff right here. <laughs> you think? <laughs> so that became my life. Mm -hmm. That became my life for the next 10 years. Right. All right? Yeah, that became my life for the next 10 years. So so in saying that, uh, when I went to music, that was another change. I mm -hmm. saw it going bad. I saw my friends going to jail. I saw a bunch of things taking place. So I said, you know what? Here we go. I'm right back to where I was when I was 18 years old. I could feel it. Yeah. And I decided once again to, to listen to that. And I changed. Yeah. I changed up. And uh, and I, I switched up and I I started doing music. You know, and I believe at the nick of time, a lot of my friends got 22 years, 25 years. And they just now coming on. Yeah. Jeez, so, you know, man. so it's, it's, I just think you have to listen when when your body and your tells you that Things are wrong and it's going down to your senses. You know, you know, you know when you're tripping. <laughs> you know when the drama's coming. Yeah, you get that tripping thing going on within you. And you, you know, you either say, I don't give a shit about tripping, or either you say, I'm gonna change my life. Somebody come get the door. You know. Yeah, exactly. we, we we got it going on, don't we, today, Mac? We got people Mac, at the just... door. <laughs> You know, technology ain't rolling with us, but guess what, boy, we represent and we know that this game has everything to do with our ability to stay on our feet and stay swag and cool with it. So we take care of that part of this equation. This pandemic, you know, this <laughs> pandemic got us doing things differently, you know, than we normally would today, uh, you know, because I was right there next to you. I you know, know man. Pandemic, I'll be right there next to you when all this so complicated stuff wouldn't be going on, you know? Yeah, yeah. So and deal you, with us, everybody. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Back. Rock with us, baby. Y'all know we still <laughs> keeping it lit. I done threw on headphones, you know. Matt got other people answering the door, you know. My my neighbor's doing his lawnmower back there. So you know what I mean? <laughs> this is going hey, down. That's <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's rappers in my backyard. Though. There that's it true, is. Right? That's true game. Yeah, we rolling with the elements. And speaking of true game, back to that, because that's why we got you, Mac, so these folks get to know what true game really is, what it looked like, and what it consists of. So it I got to ask you, how has social media contribute to our up and coming hip hop artists not having a clue about the true game that they need to be successful, really? Well, I think that they have a great advantage. Okay. Um, you know, I get to talk to people, you know, I'm, I'm real active on social media with the fans, you know, I'm mm -hmm. talking to people in uh, Germany, I'm talking to people in Korea, I couldn't speak to these people back then. Right. At one point, Come and Take a Ride was the number one hip hop song in Japan. Mm -hmm. Guess what? I didn't know. Yeah. I guess what? I didn't get it done. <laughs> but I heard from a DJ that was working in Japan and told me, hey man, you number one, congratulations. Wow. I'm like, what? And I was with one of the label heads at the time at the at the thing, and I gave him a look like, okay, we gotta talk. Yeah. Because <laughs> you get <laughs> money and I ain't getting none. Right. Yeah. So so now, you know, um, you know, their advantage is that they can sit up here and talk to their fans. Their fans can see how they live, mm -hmm. what they're going through. You know, each and every day they have that that closer interaction that we didn't have. So they have, they actually have the advantage. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I wish this was around when I was actively, you know, doing music. You know, like right now, I'm a writer. I write mm -hmm. for film and television. Um, I got a show coming out with Matt Barnes called Broken Rim. Okay. Um, and I got something with Neil Long and uh, Snoop Dogg and I have an animation. So I'm able to do music through that. I, I, and I'm also doing independent projects. And I will be releasing a soundtrack. Okay. Well, at least the youngsters on there with me, but I'm releasing a soundtrack right now called Grown Man Business. Hey. Yeah, Grown Man is hot too. You know, it's like, it, 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 it got to be God because I, I don't even know how all this is coming out of me still, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really dope. But I'm able to take advantage of that as well and have people tune into my projects or look at my films and everything through this social media. So it can be great. I think their misuse of it is they're threatening each other, they talk shit and they saying things that, like it's certain words, it's fighting words, you know? Yeah. I grew up with, somebody say your mama, then you might as well take off your jacket and get cracking because that's fighting words. Yeah. So now what I see on the internet a lot is a lot of threatening and a lot of disrespecting of, you know, people that have passed on and things like that. And everybody's watching and seeing this thing. And then they'll turn around and forget that they said that and then show a picture of themselves at the mall buying jewelry. And then guess what? Here come the other dudes that you was talking all that craziness about, not somebody losing their life. Yeah, yeah. Because we're so, dealing that with that now with all this stuff this that's going on with these young artists getting killed. They killing each other over beefs and misunderstandings. Yeah, yeah. And, they, and they can be found real easily because they're telling on themselves, you know. Your, your cell phone is a snitch. Yeah, it is. <laughs> your Instagram is a snitch. That's like your Instagram is a snitch. That's you like your it, address. Your all that, address. You, you're carrying a rat around in your pocket. <laughs> and then you wonder, damn, how they know where I was at? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so, it's stupid crazy. So it's, it's a great tool, but it can be misused at the same time. And you also also have to understand that we're being tracked. Yeah. You know, everything we say and in our movements are being tracked as well, you yeah. know? So it's, a, I guess it's a blessing and a curse. Yeah, yeah. All eyes is always on this. Don't y'all ever forget it. And oh, yeah. you know what? I got to ask you, Mac, who we got coming next out of the West Coast, man? Who's hot? Like I've been, Man, I mean, I really you might not want to get no trouble, quote nobody, but you need to give me a name, Mac. No, I really love my area. I mean, to tell you the truth, you know, I'm a little biased. You know, I love my area. I love G.I. Joe, Pac-Man, okay. um, Rody Rose, uh, um, Cobby Supreme. Uh -huh. I, I always miss somebody, but I hate doing this because I always miss somebody. Um, but my whole little crew is Jay Stone. Um, you know, that's my whole little crew. A lot of Nipsey's guys, man. Uh -huh. So my little homies, man. I mean, they super hot. All um, right. Weezy. I mean, it's, it's just it's a bunch of them. They's got, they're they all working together. They, I think they're doing a project right now called The District. Uh, I'm getting on there with them. Oh, cool. And uh, my guys are super hot right now, man. So I really concentrate on them. But I love a lot of the L.A. artists that come out. I love, I love anything L.A., man. Yeah, Dodgers, I do too. Lakers, rappers. You know, everybody. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, and so, I'm a thousand percent L.A. <laughs> yeah, I love L.A. too, man. And, Mac, I got to ask you, you got to shoot some of them hot young artists over to the yard, man. You yeah, know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? We'll Hook me up with that. Be the plug for me, man. I'm trying to get, you know, some of, some of the hot stuff on the West Coast and some of the hot stuff on the East Coast and really try to try to do this thing and just bring it forward and work on the relationships and the way we can share and keep this culture alive. And, you know, we just keep each other informed, man. So hook me yeah, up. Yeah, I definitely that, will. Man. I definitely send them over there. You know, you guys are family to me. You know, you guys are family over there. So I definitely make sure I start shooting people through. All right, good looking. And lastly, Matt, cause me and you could talk forever, man, under any circumstances. But I want to know, you got so much cool stuff going on. We want to know how we can follow your movement. Because I want to be able to keep my eye on the Mac and the burgers you building in these streets, man. So how could we follow you? What you got cracking right now? Well, you know, I'm on social media. It's b.cjmacross, you okay. know, on, on, on all of my platforms, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, 
um, Instagram, stuff like that. So I'm going to start doing some things like that. Dub C and I are formulating a podcast of our own. Okay. Uh, it's going to be called Grown Man Business, and we're going to be letting people know what's going on there, and hopefully doing some collaborations with you guys over here, you know, and um, doing things like that, and we're doing a bunch of filming and stuff like that. So as it comes, I'll be putting it out there, and I'd love to be able to have the uh, – the, the carte blanche to come back and sit down with you whenever, you know? Oh, I can't wait for us to sit down because there were so many things I still wanted to ask you. But yes. again, you're such a wealth of knowledge, you know, and you 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 rep us so well, man. And thank you so repping much. Repping Crenshaw and all of that. Man, I just appreciate you, Mac. And let's let's go back to our quote because I think it really set us up nicely for our conversation. And I think it connected the audience with where we were going. And here's the quote. A people without knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. Mm. And um, we got to keep we got to keep this tree going, man. We got to keep these roots and we got to keep on planting the seeds so other people can duplicate some of the success that not only you have accomplished, Mac, but just many people in the hip hop business. We got to get out there and, and push it forward. And you know what I wanted to say to you, Mac, thank you so much for spending your Sunday with me. You could have been on the Shaw cruising, but you... You decided to kick it with the podcast that stays lit. And for that, yeah. we love you, man. And thanks so much for kicking it with us today. So hold tight until the end of the show. And so we can holler at each other. Sound like a we'll plan? Do. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I appreciate you guys. And uh, we're going to keep it. We're going to keep this thing going. I appreciate you guys so much. All right, and we appreciate you. And you know what, audience? We appreciate you for tuning in and rocking with the podcast that stays lit. Make sure that you guys subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that bell. That's how you're going to learn, grow, and get in this grind that we got going on this podcast. Also, check out our website at www.rappersinmybackyard.com. Sign up for our newsletter. And uh, we're just excited today like we are every Sunday. And um, I want to end this like we begin this with true game. Y'all heard what Max said. Y'all know that we are responsible for keeping this culture moving forward as it refers to hip hop and how the growth starts and how the growth continues relies in us. So I can't wait till next Sunday to kick it with y'all. But for right now, y'all chill, cruise, and enjoy the Sunday, right? Stay lit, baby. We rap about relationships, entertainment, and music. You heard? You heard?